Hello, this is Dr. Peter Matthews at the University of Stirling doing another social policy podcast for the module SBCU 913, Understanding Social Policy. And the podcasts have all been um, with academics. And today I'm sat in my kitchen to record a very different podcast with somebody far more important than an academic. So would you like to introduce yourself? My name is Leslie Matthews. And I'm Peter Matthews's mother. Yeah, she's my mum. Um, so, and the reason why I'm interviewing my mum will become obvious with the next question. So, can you just say? I know it's very rude to ask a woman her age, but can you say when you were born? I don't mind being asked <laughs> at all. I was born in March 1947. So. Those of, those of you who are studying this module, you should know that the, the founding of the welfare state in, in the UK is often referred to as that post-war Labour government from 1945 to 1950-51. And so you were born slap bang in the middle of that government. I was actually born pre the NHS, which I think is a... An important point, actually. Yeah, yeah. So the because the um, the health the NHS didn't come into being until was it January January, January nineteen forty eight. Yeah. So I was born in a nursing home. And then so that probably would have been um, paid for through sort of some charitable contributions or um, Providence Society. My father was working at that time, and he worked for London Transport. So I, might, that, might have yeah. got some care some benefit in kind. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah, or if I had some insurance, yeah, some private yeah. insurance. I yeah, just or, don't know. or workplace insurance. Yes, but yeah. then and then as well, there was uh, healthcare through voluntary organisations, yes. charitable hospitals, yes. and also the local authority as well, weren't there? Yes, the local authority had some health duties, but they were mainly, I think, of a preventive kind. Mm. Though there were clinics. Yeah, 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 and things had changed during the war. Although obviously that was mm. before your time. Yeah. So, yeah, so you're born in 1947, so you're what we refer to as the baby boomer generation of yeah. um, the post-war period. Um, can you talk about your childhood in London and what that was like? Well, um, London, there were still bomb sites, and also housing was still a problem. Lots of private landlords and people living in pretty poor conditions, and indeed... I was brought up in when I look back on, and even at the time, knew were pretty poor conditions. It was a street of terraced blocks of terraced housing, uh, built probably pre First World War, and a lot of them, not only ours, were divided into two. So you had somebody living at the top, and we lived on the bottom. Like they were flatted, but it wasn't a proper flat. You both shared the same front door, for example. And so essentially, you were overcrowded. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. There was a small scullery, cold water tap, no electricity. Um, and then what would have been a, a room attached to the there was, there was a larder in the scullery, then a small room, but that we called the kitchen. And we just sat, we, we all sat in it and listened. Listen to the radio, you're saying you haven't had any electricity. That's right. We had a radio with a battery with what they called an accumulator. And that had to be taken up to a shop to be charged every now and then. And then two bedrooms. Note, no bathroom. Yeah. An outside toilet, which actually wasn't down the end of the garden. You went out the back door and just turned to your right. And the, the door was outside, but it went into the house, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Fabric of the house. Yeah. So, and then, so you, you, did you live in that, how long did you live in that property? I lived in that till I was 19 years of age and left home. Yeah. And we only got electricity put in, in the late 1950s. And my mother sold her piano, a relic of previous good times, in order to get the cash needed yeah. to have electricity put in. Yeah. So, so you lived in overcrowded conditions, pretty poor quality property yeah. in for until nineteen sixty six when yeah. kind of a lot of the sort of stories of the welfare state kind of point that suggest that problems have been resolved fairly yes. swiftly yeah. and but it seems that that's not they the case. for everybody, no, certainly not. Yeah. Um, the significant factor in all of this was my father having a stroke um, in the early 1950s. I don't remember him as a well man, so it was before I was five. Yeah. Um, and he couldn't work after that. He was a manual labourer. He couldn't work. 
And so we were basically living on what was then called national assistance. Yeah. And then national assistance as well was one of the innovations of the the welfare state. Mm -hmm. The the National Assistance Act was one of the Mm -hmm. acts of parliament the Labour government passed. What did that, what did national assistance mean in practice? Well, of course, you have to think of national assistance in relation to national insurance. And Beveridge assumed that people would all pay into their insurance scheme, they would have benefits to which they had entitlement and rights through paying insur- this national insurance. But there was obviously going to be a, a residue of mm. people who hadn't been able to build up the contributions. And we fell into that. It was supposed to be a sort of safety net. Yeah. Well, it was a safety net with lots of holes in it. Mm. And even in those days, there was the sense of you weren't as good or morally right if you were claiming national assistance. There was a sense of shame about yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah, and also in that period, it was uh, with the economy recovering from the post-war, from the war. It was a period of high employment. Yes, so right. actually, from the vast majority of people wouldn't have been claiming that's benefits; right. they would have been paying national insurance yeah. Yeah. on the provi- on the <laughs> basis that they would never probably they, they claim the pension yeah. when they retired, Absolutely. but not actually claim unemployment that's, benefits that's or right. the other yeah. benefits yeah. that were available. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so that sort of <laughs> that conditionality that we find mm. going right back to the poor law yeah. is still there yes. in that post, yes. uh, post-war Absolutely, system. yeah. It's a yeah. thread that runs through from 1601. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, sort of, so national assistance provided your household with the main income. Yeah. So what did that mean in practice? Well, then? I don't know the exact amount. I do know our rent was very, very low. Um... And what you would say, what landlord could honestly claim a lot for what we were living in? But rents were controlled. And the other big act that I do remember having an impact was the 1957 Rent Act, which meant if your landlord improved, and we'll put improved in inverted commas, the property, he could legitimately put up the rent, Mm, which mm. basically meant in our case, he took out the old black range which was in the kitchen. Which so we got Victorian around. style Yes, range. yes, old yeah, black yeah. range. You had to black lead, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you could boil up some water on it. You wouldn't yeah. have to use the gas cooker out in the kitchen. Um, remember, we didn't have electricity for an electric kettle. Um, and put in a gas fire. Yeah, and that was counted as an improvement. Yeah, it was yeah. counted as an improvement. Yeah, yeah. 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 But then I suppose, to be, to be fair, on the Conservative government who introduced that rent act, that was because rent controls meant that landlords yes. weren't investing yes. in their properties. Absolutely, they couldn't afford to, the landlords yeah. were saying. There was an element of truth in, in what, well, more than an element of truth, it was true. Yeah. We're not getting enough income from our houses to be able to invest and improve them, and we want to improve them yeah. for our tenants. Yeah. So much, we might, even today, with the issues of housing, we might want rent controls, but there are yeah. costs yes, to doing are. so yeah. that you experience. Yeah, yeah. 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 So your rates were very low. Um, mm-hmm. Then, so what? What the money that left over after you paid your rent? What kind of lifestyle did that leave you to live? Oh, pretty poor. Um, new clothing was unknown, um, so it was always hand me downs. And I had an older sister, three years older than me, who's now sadly dead. But that stayed with her to adulthood. How can you shop in a charity shop? You know, we had to put up with all those hand-me-downs. And I can... So it was actually hand-me-downs from other people. It yes, was hand-me-downs yeah. from within the family. Yeah. Within the family mainly. But I do remember once, it's a very clear memory, <clears throat> that um, the early days of National Assistance, you went up to some office in Ealing to collect it. And they must have... Some of the staff must have thought, oh, this is a bit sad, isn't it? These poor families must have hearts of gold. And there was clothing you could get. And my mother got for me a maroon coat, child's coat, with what we called a highwayman's collar. It was been fashionable you know, at that time. And on the one hand, I was very proud of this. It was probably in really decent nick, I have a vague rec- recollection. But I also would walk around thinking, the child that once had this might see me in it and might come over and say, you're wearing my coat. Mm-hmm. Mm. So um, is that everyday shame of poverty? Yes, yes, yeah, so yes, it was, yeah, you down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and also the only reason we had decent meat was my uncle, that's my mother's brother, um, was the manager of a butcher shop in Mayfair. It's still there, Allen's of Mayfair, very high class butcher shop. So we got a Sunday joint, 
and which kept us going Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then sausages, I think, and mince later on in the week yeah. to keep us going through that. I think, Al, there wouldn't have been a lot of, or what meat we would have had would have been pretty crummy yeah. um, if it wasn't for the fact that we were getting that. But under that National Assistance Act, if you were getting regular support in kind, as it was called, if that was known by National Assistance, they would have docked my mother's, or kept my father's benefit. Yeah. Yeah. So you yeah. were living, looking over your shoulder all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've talked to me before about when you got a TV. Oh, yes. So yes, when yes. was that then? Well, it was the late 1950s, I seem to recall. My father, disabled working class man who only had ever known work. That was pretty awful for him. Um, uh, and so he used to go to the cinema every afternoon. Mm. But cinemas were closing down by the late 1950s. And my mother must have been able to read it. Oh, she also worked on the side, by the way. This uncle who gave us the meat, also, she cleaned his house for him. Well, him and his wife and family. Again, that was all on the side. So she must, and she was very good at managing money, my mother. She had to be. All her life, she'd never known anything other than poverty. It was either that or you were in terrible debt. We never were. She managed to scrape together enough to rent a television. But you, you also had an annual visit from the National Assistance, just to check up on your circumstances. A mother lived in fear of this and said, if they're coming, I've got to put, should I put a, um, a blanket over it, you know, to hide it? If they see I've got a television, they'll, they'll be suspicious mm. that I'm getting extra money. And actually, somebody had, must have told on her because she was angry, I remember, after she, she said, somebody, they asked me, did I have a brother who lived on South Down Avenue? And she said, no, I, she said, I could say, no, I would never tell a lie. I don't have a brother living on South Down Avenue. It was quite true. And she knew they were fishing for somebody said she goes out every day. Because that's what she did. She went out every day to do this cleaning. Yeah. So, so basically, in the contemporary discourse of benefits, she was a benefit fraud. She was. She yes, was she was. Yes, yes. Yeah. It was yeah. the only way to keep your head above water if you were respectable. And my mother... Yeah was very respectable and had aspirations for us yeah and it was a source of anger for my father and bitterness that they couldn't provide in the way they wanted to they had yeah. these two children and um, two daughters and they wanted them to have nice clothes they yeah, wanted yeah. Them to, yeah. Um, in a nice society with growing affluence as well absolutely there was a photograph of me and my sisters when my dad was well my mother and my sister i'm in a push chair so it has to be before. And we'd gone to Butlins for a week's holiday. Imagine that. Mm. That would have been the very early 50s, probably about 50, 1950. Yeah. And yeah. my mother once saying when I was a bit older, you know, it's not your father's fault. You know, if, if, he, if he was only well, we would, you know, it would have yeah. been better for yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So we sort of painting a pretty grim picture of the post-war welfare state here of sort of living on national assistance mm. being really tough, yeah. really difficult experience of poverty, very poor housing conditions. Mm. So very different to a lot of the rosy pictures oh, yeah. that are portrayed. Yeah. But the welfare state did benefit you in terms of the 1944 Education Act yes, in some definitely. ways, didn't it? So because you, were, you yeah. went to grammar school. Yes, I did. Yes, I, yeah. I, I passed the 11 plus and my mother was delighted she told um, the old woman upstairs who didn't have children, oh, you know, Leslie's passed the 11 plus. My sister hadn't. That's another story about division of siblings. Oh, Leslie's passed the 11 Why are you so happy? You can't afford to send her there. And there was, again, some truth in that because you had to have the uniform. And, yes, you applied for a grant and there was from the local authority and there was all the shame associated with doing that. But I remember my sister would be leaving school at 15 her blazer was royal blue. My blazer was going to be navy blue, so my mother dyed it. She got a badge. You had to have a badge on the grammar school from a neighbour whose older daughter, now having left the school, can we have the badge off it? And that was sewed on. I don't recall thinking I'd look as shabby as the rest, but I think I'm shabbier than the rest. But I suspect I would have done. Yeah. And the thing that I do laugh about, actually, and even when I think about it, she went in the summer sales to the school suppliers, Abeneath is in Ealing, and bought me, you had to have the proper shorts to do PE in. You're growing to them. <laughs> During that era, these shorts came to my knees. I was still wearing them at 16. They still fitted. 
And I used to say, I would have been good at the high jump. I got over the bar. <laughs> the, the, the shorts didn't. The yeah. shorts knocked the bar off. Yeah. How yeah. much I rolled them up around the waist, <laughs> stuck a great sausage around the waist. So I can remember that. Uh-huh. So, yeah, so the, the education was there as an opportunity, but even then, it's just these situations. Came with a cost. Really, came and I say, cost. yeah, um, the woman next door to us, she had six children. The two boys had left home. She had four daughters. And I'm not romantic about the working class, although I'm proud of my working class origins. When it came to sitting the 11 plus, she didn't send her girls to school. What is the point of educating girls? And that mm. is a very typical working class attitude. I suspect it's still around now in some areas. So my mother and father, who had aspirations, and who were both intelligent people, who, because of their working class origins, yeah. had never been able to yeah. benefit from education, were certainly going to make sure yeah. that I could, if I, you know, their daughter would, if she could. But that kind of that also reflects the wider gendered assumptions in your whole story as well. The fact that that post-war welfare state was based on the model of a skilled male worker supporting a family. Yeah. So in your case, the skilled male worker wasn't there. So you're really, really struggling mm. yes. to make ends meet. And in the case of your neighbour not sending her daughters mm. to school for the 11 plus that's well it's okay because they'll get married to yes, a man exactly. who will be in work. yeah also um, significantly the bus depot was a big space of labour her husband was a driver which was a skilled job my dad was a cleaner mm. they were buying their house we were just renting yeah. so these, these are the subtle differences I'm conscious that you teach at a Scottish university remember I'm talking about London England yeah. and I don't know how much these things pervade also Scottish life and perhaps in the big cities they would have but certainly that was very significant um, what you mentioned about Scotland it was true there and from my own research I know that of um, particularly when the deindustrialization first began in the 1960s with the sort of change in industry and it was the hit the low skilled workers first yes, and, you, yeah. and the inclined bank around Glasgow yeah. you got growing it was one of the first areas in the UK to experience growing unemployment yes. yeah. in the 1960s yeah. and they couldn't didn't really understand why yeah. it was because yeah. these very low skilled industries food production yeah. some of the very low skilled jobs in the shipyards were just going because yes. they were being replaced by machines yes. And so people were being thrown. Yeah. There, were, there wasn't the yes. work available yes. in the local area. Yeah. So that was true in Scotland as You're well. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so you you went to your grammar school mm-hmm. and you got your A levels. Eventually, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. And yeah. then went off to Manchester University. I did. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you managed to take advantage of that post-war expansion in the yes, higher yes, education I as did. well. Yes, yeah. I did. I did. Yeah. 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 Something I know made a huge difference to my life, yeah. and in terms of being able to look back on it. With a sort because I did social policy at yeah, university, yeah, yeah. so I'm able to get some sort of intellectual distance from it, which my sister, who became a hairdresser, never did. Mm. But that was interesting. Most of the girls of her era, including the ones next door, you just went down the Great West Road and got a job in one of the factories down on the Great West Road. But my mother again had this thing: you can have a skill that you can sell. Mm. You know, so trained to be a hairdresser, which was job my sister didn't actually like yeah. once she could give up she did yeah. um, but it was the idea from my, I know my mother's point of view you could end up being the breadwinner and if you're the breadwinner you're better off having a skill than ending up being a cleaner like me mm. 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 so I know that would have been consciously thought of mm. behind it all yeah yeah and then, so you did social policy or social administration, mm-hmm. as it was mm-hmm. known. And then, um, what what did you go into then after your social? Um, I knew degree? by then I wanted to be a social worker. Social work was expanding. Um, there was going to be the changes in legislation in I think seventy two, but you could get you could get in work as what they called an unqualified social worker. It horrifies me now, but that's what I did. And then you would be seconded by the local authority to get your certificate of qualification, your CQSW. Yeah is what happened with me yeah, yeah. yeah. so again the changes to the post-war state yeah. benefited you then that expansion of yeah. social work from the late yes. 1960s onwards yes. and, yeah um, I suppose because that period that late 60s period was all that kind of 
Kathy come home, yeah. the rediscovery of poverty mm-hmm. issues. How yes, much yeah. were you aware of Oh, very that? much. Yeah. I was chair of the Child Poverty Action Group in Bradford when I moved there in 1969, yeah. about 1970 onwards. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. What, Frank Field came and talked yeah. to us. He was the chair of it. Yeah. Say, so yeah. what, was the, what was that poverty like then in the late 60s, early 1970s in Bradford that you were experiencing? Um, well, there were still quite a few back-to-back houses. Yeah. I mean, the local authority was so just to, there. So just yeah. to explain, they were yeah. one up, one down. So basically two or two up, two. two. Two up. You had downstairs, you had one room and this what they called the cellar head kitchen. Yeah. So you would have a cellar. And then upstairs, two bedrooms. But then the th- fact was you had... Two of these houses, in, no, they were in terraces, back. but they were back yes, to back. Yes, they were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you had yeah. effectively had two rows of houses yes. attached yes. to one another. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they're very, yeah. very small. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, and single parents, and they were a growing number. Yeah, were still extremely poor. Yeah. And, and also stigmatised, 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 definitely yeah. stigmatised. Yeah. From I mean, all that stuff about the swinging sixties, forget it. There was still a huge stigma mm. about them being an unmarried mother yeah there was still a lot of poverty and Bradford had some well a lot of local so these large council estates some of which would have been fairly newly built but they didn't have central heating mm, yeah yeah so the sort of things we take for granted were very cold and people had their and I, and I did have families where they had their electricity cut off yeah because they hadn't paid their electricity bill so you had children living in houses where it was lit by candles yeah yeah really yeah, dangerous yeah, yeah. and um did you uh, Bradford, uh, most people know of it, or it's one of it, it has a reputation for the in migration of people from mm. Pakistan mm. in the night from the nineteen mm. forties onwards. Mm. Did that growing diversity of the city in, impact on your practice as social um, work? Well, in the early seventies, <clears throat> the pattern had been in the sixties: single men coming over and working in the mills at night. Mm. And some of them, in fact, I did have one family would take a wife over here, white. Yeah. Um, wife from, from the working class yeah. and so that was certainly from the early 1970s onwards and then the mills started closing down and then they started bringing wives over from Pakistan mm. um, and that continues to this day mm. and the pattern now is one partner would have been born and brought up over here the other one's brought in from the mere poor yeah 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 so to sort of go back to the timeline then, so you were in Bradford in the 1970s, and uh, when did your mum eventually get a council property, a council oh, house? Right. Well, there was the formation of the Greater London Council in the early 1970s, I'm trying to remember, was it 1974? Certainly the early 1970s. As a result of that, small London boroughs were amalgamated. My mother had lived, was still living in that tiny little bottom flat, with the old lady still above, she'd been widowed by then. With my sister, actually. And that was Ealing, which was a Conservative borough. It amalgamated with Acton and Southall, which were Labour boroughs. And so they had both invested in council housing. And so my mother was finally offered, having been on the council house waiting list for probably over 20 years, offered a two-bedroom flat in Acton, which she moved to. Just, she wasn't on the top floor, just under the top floor. She loved it. She was an advertisement for Tower Block Living. She adored it. The views out, the lightness, the airiness. Bathroom and separate toilet. Well, of course, we always had a separate toilet, but it was outside the house, of course. So it was really, mm. it was bliss. I, those last few years of my mother's life were lovely. Yeah. And all mod cons in the kitchen, I presume. Well, I um, don't know about that. She, she still had... A, um, a washing machine and a spin dryer. I don't think she might not have even had a washing machine. She certainly had a spin dryer. She loved a spin dryer, uh, and uh, and it was a gas fridge for some reason. Oh, yeah, did, yeah, yeah it didn't make. Oh, so it had gas in the. Box. Oh, it did. Yes, yes. Now Ronan Point, which yeah, of course is yeah. one of the um, tragedies, but Ronan Point was built by sort of blocks of concrete, and somebody had, they had gas in it. But somebody, I do remember it all. It happened. Um, thinking of my mother, but no, somebody had 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 a friend put in a gas fire yeah, and the yeah. gas fire obviously hadn't been put in correctly and it blew out and yeah. it was early in the morning six o'clock so that corner of the block that fell down um, and a lot of people were not killed because they weren't up yet mm. for work mm. Mm. Uh, so so you so your mum got the council flat mm. um also i believe the block of flats is famous oh yes <laughs> if you watch only fools and horses the credits at the start 
which I think are Milson Mandela House. No, they're not. They're Corf Towers, South <laughs> Acton. <laughs> yeah, your mum lives. Yeah. Um, and then your first uh, flat with my dad in Bradford was also yes, a council flat. It was, as well. yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was easy for us to get a council flat as we got married. In fact, we got a two-bedroom one, even though we didn't have children. Interestingly, that has since been pulled down. Mm. And it was certainly concrete and getting mould on it and all the rest of it. Mm. To my knowledge, my mother's those flats are still up. They, yeah. were, they were well-designed and well-built. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. So it's, sort of, you know, it's that the high flats is not just this story of awful antisocial behaviour and poor build quality. No, Actually, some of them no, were, were no, good. yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. And then you had my brother yeah. in 1979, and yeah. I was born in 1982. Mm-hmm. And so, obviously, under the NHS, un- unlike yeah. myself, yeah, yeah. And uh, you've told the story that you wanted to call you were in hospital so long with me that you wanted to call me Neil Henry Stanley. So my initials <laughs> would be NHS. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, clearly that institution mattered a lot. And then also, so uh, compare the. Oh, you gave up work mm. when you had, mm. and yes. why? Why was that? Well, there wasn't. Not so many women were doing it yet. I think we were on the cusp. We were all feminists. There were a group of us, babysitting circle. All of us had had professional jobs mm. and gave it up for about six or seven years while our children were young. I think most of us only had two mm. children. So there wasn't that... I didn't think of carrying on with work. But I'm presuming things like, like that we take for granted now, like maternity pay or parental leave. Oh, yes, that's right. And yeah. childcare yeah. just weren't really on well, the radar. De- yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. And the childcare wasn't as developed as it yeah, is now. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, sort of childminder yeah. at one end or a nanny yeah. Yeah. at another yeah, end. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, certainly not in Bretton North. North, in the north, in yeah, the, yeah. Wealthy. If you're on a public, might have done in London, especially if you're on a public sector income as yes, well. So yes, yeah, yeah, you're very wealthy. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, but still, sort of one of the the last hurrahs of the welfare state did benefit you, though, as a mother, in terms of child benefit. Oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what? Yeah, well, um, that was paid to the woman. Yeah, paid to the mother. Yeah. So so what what had your what would have your mother received? I don't remember the amount, but she would have only just got it for me because she didn't get it for the first child. Yeah, and that was family allowance. Yes, yes, yeah. it was family allowance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and I actually know this more from my social policy work. When it was first paid, there was a almost a pre-feminist idea. It should go into the mother's um, purse, not the man, because not all men would hand it over. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it was. Um, so even so, family allowance had yeah. that. Yes. And then, so how did child benefit differ from? So you pay for both um, children. So you went down to the post office every week. Yeah. Yeah. So and just a nice, just a. Well, it was just a little bit extra. I, I remember sort of saving it up a bit. So even though you in a, in a household with a fairly decent income oh, yeah. in the in yeah. the 80s yeah. you were still receiving this yes. benefit yeah it was so a universal were, benefit yeah. Yeah. so there yeah. no administered by two ladies in Newcastle I think yeah. as opposed to any means tested one which needs an army of lower grade civil servants to yeah, which, um, like, administer <coughs> which national assistance being a classic case yeah. where you you, yeah. you talked about the having the inspectors come yes, around every exactly. year, yes, having actually, to go down yes. to the office and be yes, assessed, yes, and that's because yeah, it's such yeah. a complex means tested yes, benefit. Yeah, a bit like universal credit today, which is Absolutely. going so yes, well. Yeah. So yeah. So this last hurrah of the welfare mm. state, this was well, essentially is almost a citizen's income. Yeah. Is if you had children, you yeah. got this money. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of child benefit. But the other thing you've got to remember, you're going on about you were so long in the hospital. Yeah, I had two difficult pregnancies. Yeah. And I was looked after. Yeah. And you were, you know, yeah. both my children were. I had two healthy, normal babies at the end of it. Yeah. Which may not have been the outcome in a previous era. Yeah. 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 So all in all then in your in your that in your life post war, mm. it's been a a mixed bag so there mm. was some you experienced mm. the the best of the welfare state in yeah. terms of a good education and the expansion mm. of, po- of secondary education and then further educa- uh, higher education mm. um, you got a good quality job in, mm. in a profession yeah. through the expanding state yeah. and then the uh, being a mother you benefited from yes. the, the the resource of the state there, but then yeah. also some of the negative sides of it. So the fact that that initial, as it was created in 1945, it was a system designed for households with a a man in yes. work. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
there was still that um, underlying assumption yeah. that that was how families lived and how rapidly that changed, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I suppose that's something you would have seen in your work as a social oh, yes, worker as well, yes, how yeah, that, those yeah. family dynamics yes, changed yeah, and yeah. how, I suppose it's, we've ended up with a complex welfare system because people live complex lives. Mm, absolutely. And yes. all those sorts of the, the various yeah. ways families and households can yes. have, yes. have yeah. problems means that the welfare yeah. state has to respond to those. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. It kind of that very simple beverage model sort of breaks Breaks yes, down. Yeah. I I still give two cheers for beverage. You know, I say when I look, I think back, and I think I was very lucky to mm. be born at that time, mm. but very lucky to have the sort of parents who would support me mm. um, when all down the street mm. the other girls were going out to to, to work. Yeah, yeah, and also, but so I suppose as well, your story highlights the what we now term resilience of your your mother in particular, mm. in dealing with a very bad situation yes. yeah. and yeah, or committing crimes, essentially, yes. by committing yes. benefit yeah. fraud, yeah. but to get the family on. Yeah. And I suppose that in even today, when we have these sort of horrible benefit scrounger headlines in the yeah. newspapers, yeah. actually, if you look at the academic research on people who are out of work, people who are long-term mm. unemployed, they still share that aspiration to work. Mm. Yeah. It's just that they don't, the yeah. opportunities... Yes, aren't there for them there. Yeah. so yeah similar sort of conditions yes, that's that people right. yeah. Live in yeah okay well thank you very much thank you peter